I saw this, it's a quote really from a newspaper article which is talking about the, uh, the new government initiative and I thought it was quite funny. It's sort of the idea of they want, wanted a new city for somewhere. We haven't really decided yet. Uh, I also saw the article talk about this. So, you know, the idea of quality design is optional. <laughs> and it might have a local amenities, but we're not too sure yet. Um, and access to employment is actually quite a nice thing, but not necessarily essential. Um, I'm not going to talk about this at any great length, because obviously it's been talked about in, in so many dimensions tonight. But it is interesting that it still inspires us uh, over, the, over the last hundred years. Um, and other people try to draw things in slightly different ways. But it's interesting how, in some ways, the graphic remains the same. And I think in some ways, you know, that what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about this evening is the problem of that graphic and the literalness in the sense of how that then starts to determine uh, a spatial dimension within new settlement. Uh, I can't remember who gave me this, um, but interesting. Uh, and then this is actually the, the future of uh, Hanoi and again it takes that kind of literal diagram of the, of the hub and spur of something as a kind of potentially a polycentric uh, a regional plan but shockingly abused in the sense that um, this one out here they wanted to build for students because then they would go out on the train or stay there, get extremely drunk, and not have to come back into the city. So it was an idea of actually cleansing Hanoi from uh, 20,000 students uh, drinking a lot. And there'd be a very thin, tenuous line that would connect you every three days by a very slow train. And I think, you know, these are the problems when we, we look at this idea as a kind of a solution uh, of trying to address the kind of larger metropolitan region. And I think that's some of the things that we're interested in is, is, is how does one start to think about territory at that scale? And I think in that sense, you know, the polycentric uh, kind of diagram is interesting when looked at as a kind of network across a much larger territory. But how can then we move from something which is more of a diagram about spur and hub to something which is much more about a mosaic something that's integrated, um, that is differentiated, and therefore allows a kind of improvement in internal synergies and interactions within those different districts. And it's very important then that differentiation becomes a key element in establishing uh, the sustainability of any growing of, of, of a new settlement. And differentiation is important for, for those key issues. Legibility, integration, self-organizing, and the role of architecture can play in that. It's interesting that uh, a development that I've seen in detail recently, and I think it might be part of EBSFLEET, or the, a, a sort of the, the new incarnation of EBSFLEET, is we're still actually producing something where you've got that kind of blob of red in the centre of the city that is going to be only your zoning for retail. Um, it's surrounded by green space and then everything else kind of goes out in, in central petal or concentric circles um, to deliver a kind of equality uh, of residential environment where every residence has a similar kind of uh, proximity to everything else. But somehow, how does one then start to engage in, in, in a 30-year plan? How does this kind of form start to enable uh, growth? And yet, when you look at something which is 1929, when you look at, so that's, that's 2012, 2014, that's 1929, um, the neighbourhood plan. And yet, this is much more sophisticated. You know, you can start to see, has this got a pointer? You can start to see, actually, very clearly that there are elements that are ex can extend beyond the scale of actually the neighbourhood. You can see it in its dimension. You can see that actually across the street, these streets don't actually connect. So integration and separation are built into the diagram. So that allows districts to gain character and therefore offer potential um, 
sort of home to different types of resources, whereas this one doesn't have that. We've seen the application of that diagram recently with uh, Axister, um, with the, uh, the Wolfson Prize. Um, and again, you know, we take this as a diagram. It's, 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 it's just something to, 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 to sort of use as an operational tool to move forward in, a, in an argument. <laughs> and I was quite surprised to see that there's actually a literal translation of that um, in some of the diagrams that is actually in the document. Uh, again, you know, there, there is a kind of a center which then is sort of a series of concentric rings are wrapping around it. It has a hard edge, and it's repeated within the regional plan um, as this kind of extension of Oxford. I understand it as a kind of an abstraction, but even the abstraction needs to then understand how it might grow, might extend, might differentiate, and might change over time. And it comes down to some of the things that you see in all, all briefing documents, where you get a 100 sort of meter radius walking distance, the walkable neighborhood. Um, and then this relates to actually something where there's a, di a sort of a very simple relationship between at the center you get density, and at the edge you don't. Um, here you get urbanism, and here you get animals. And then you just repeat them. And you can go on for this forever. You know, this is actually an extension to Basingstoke. You can't get to it because of the infrastructure, the railway, the, the B roads, the A roads, etc. And you know, all of a sudden they were thinking, well, if we have a center three times, so they're 200 meters apart, and we also then have density, which is then concentrically diminishing as you move towards greenery. Now the problem we had was actually as soon as you start to then engage in a conversation about taking one of those red dots away and moving a red dot, you know you're not going to win the project. And you know the ability to actually create any type of intensification or differentiation with an urban environment um, with so little as resources um, at your feet is very difficult. So what we were trying to do is understand how the kind of bringing the, uh, the idea of consolidating all of those potentials at one point and intensifying it to create something that is actually really bringing the value of this space. If you can't, sorry, if you can't actually access it, then actually why would you turn your back onto the country park, which was seen as a focus? So again, how can we then move away from the diagram and understand how you can uh, evolve this very simplistic kind of relationship between these elements to actually understand how it then starts to engage with place and then therefore create a kind of intensification. So what we did was just move the, the actual the city centre or let's say the neighbourhood centre towards the park and had the park and the, city, and the neighborhood center actually very close together. And so density was actually on the park side. And we felt that had value. Why wouldn't you have density actually being much more differentiated uh, across that uh, new development rather than actually having this very simplistic kind of relationship? And this is something we've been looking at uh, in, in, in many different places, really. Um, looking at a, a new development, a new knowledge city in, in Guangzhou, um, and looking at also, it's funny enough that Yolanda was showing Michigan campus, because we've been looking at American campuses quite closely. Um, Berkeley and also Santa Cruz is very interesting in terms of actually how they deliver urbanity um, within quite rural settings, at the same time using very little resources to create intensification and differentiation and a sense of place. And so, you know, I won't go into it in detail, but here we were looking at taking something away from the middle of the site as a nodal concentration of retail and amenity and actually using it to actually bring porosity and permeability through a new development. So you're bringing nodality at certain points and then extending the civic landscape 
was something that then connected the, the, the retail elements. And you can see this in actually how American campuses work, the way they dissipate um, amenity through the site in an almost organic way, just as Yolanda was saying. You know, they cross the field, they make, make a path. And how can we learn from this in urbanism? So again, it's using a kind of campus spatial organization as a strategy for really delivering low density, sprawling environments, you know, and bringing them a kind of a, a, an urbanism to it. Now, when we look at, when we started looking at Ebsfleet with land securities, um, we also looked at traditional uh, urban typologies. Because again, what you find is that all of them start to have a much more informal relationship between uh, all their resources. So, you know, you have front doors, you'll have shops, you'll have a ground floor which is flexible. The, the post office can become the pub, can become a house, can become a tea shop. Um, you can park your car pretty much anywhere. You know, the marketplace becomes a car park. It becomes the fairground. It becomes the football pitch. Um, and in a sense, it's always on the way to somewhere else. So it's not like the, the, the kind of main space is actually sort of centred or it's off to one side. You actually are moving through this at all times. So intensification is being consolidated. And you know, these are obviously historic towns, but how can we learn from these? Not in terms of pastiche, but in terms of kind of spatial organizational strategy. In, at that time, um, Ebsfleet was not as large as the, as the area that we have now in terms of what's been designated as part of the, um, uh, the, the new plan. But at that time, it was quite small. And it was really looking at the kind of the nodal point of Eurostar and the, and the, and the quarry. And again, one of the problems was actually trying to move away from something which is a repeatable stamp of car courts, um, perimeter housing, and green spaces. And I think this is one of the problems that we need to think about is that somehow when you take the house and the home away from its normal setting and put it into something which could be a garden city or a, a new town or a settlement, now I think we need to think about a, a sort of what the role of the home is and how the, 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 there might be a, a greater influence, let's say, or exchange between home and civic space as an extension of that. We might use our home in a completely different way. So what we started to look at was actually how this very first bit of Ebsfleet in the valley, in the quarry, could actually gain some kind of uh, sort of value from building at the bottom of the hill in the shade, because the quarry is actually creating a shadow, and then consolidating everything into very small places. So again, all we had was a few shops and a school, but the ability over 30 years to actually then grow a community. So how would you do that? So one of those was actually really thinking about that central spine as something that delivered everything for you, and differentiating the housing offer as much as possible. You know, I know that at that time, they were interested in actually keeping it as like an estate, as a kind of managing uh, Ebsfleet as in perpetuity. But later on, they started to look at maybe selling bits off to other developers. So how do you start a project of this scale? So one of the key things we were looking at was actually you know, the approach and how you bring all those kind of civic amenities into something which was quite uh, consolidated spatially, the school starts to feed into the life of the street. Um, those moments of congregation start to inhabit and are becoming visible in the intensification of the main spaces of the, of, of the, of the town. And then this was obviously developed further. But alongside that, it was understanding how housing had to then respond to place, uh, the differentiation of type and how one could actually start to think about not a product that is then put across and then just delivered and dumped onto ground, but as soon as you had a slope, a 1 in 20 slope, you needed to think about things like integration of cars, um, access, um, you know, sort of inclusive design, etc. 
And these started to drive the, the way in which we thought about housing and landscape. So each of these areas were quite different in their approach and to the type of housing it delivered. So self-organized communities um, and neighborhoods had different relationships to landscape and to its edges. And was about delivering, you know, as much uh, different kind of qualities of living space and the relationship of house to garden to, to town. Landscape became specific. It wasn't just the green buffer, the green space that filled it in. It was about engaging and the, the, the community and, and creating stakeholders um, with the kind of residents of, of Ebbsfleet. So the landscape was actually designed so that it was really part of the character building of, of Ebbsfleet itself. The problem, on, problem is, is that the first phase of Ebbsfleet is this, and I believe it's being built out as, as you know, right now. Um, and obviously there's about four or five years between the work that we did, and there's been a crash in between the work that we did. Um, and, you know, what we have is actually, sadly, is exactly what you don't want. It's a series of houses that look, you know, like Kent houses, because there's a bit of black wood there, and there's an oak tree here, and there's a little funny thing on the roof. Um, but your garden's still one and a half metres long, and it's about five metres deep, and it's exactly the kind of house you would have in uh, an outer borough of London. It's just uh, you're at the bottom of a quarry instead. Um, but I think this is one of the problems, is actually how you start. I mean, you know, I'll talk about it a bit in the middle, but when you look at Almira, it's about pioneers. Who are the first people you want to attract? And I think it's interesting when you look at places like Bath, Berkeley, etc. It's that those first settlement and that first phase is really important about um, sort of engaging with a different type of population. But as I said, maybe, maybe what's interesting with uh, the new, um, the, the, the kind of new start to Ebbsfleet is that <coughs> it's actually a larger area. And so all of a sudden there's actually a, 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 a potentially a, a more opportunity really to, to embed it and network it in, rather than just a train and a tram or a fast bus that would take you to Blue Water uh, across a quarry. Maybe there's the ability now to really network it into something which is quite differentiated by its fact that it's on a river, it's a, a riverside, uh, and it's got a lot of the historic elements along the south side of the Thames, um, back from that. And then it's obviously got its connection south through the, uh, the corridor of the Eurostar. So potentially now it can really knit together. I mean, obviously it might necessarily have to move away from being a London borough, but becoming much more of a, a larger um, district. But what could that be? Interestingly, in Oslo, uh, they've been looking at extending Oslo. The, the, it's kind of expanded as much as it can. And in terms of its distance, obviously it can expand within, it can be redensified. But one of the last bits of, of green space at the edge of the suburbs of Oslo is in the south. This is central Oslo here. And this is Gershud Stenhard, which is right on the sort of south uh, east. And they're extending a series of existing uh, subway um, metro links out to these new edges. And what was interesting about this was it that it was actually a kind of a, a series of developments, small scale, linked by a tram and public transport, which drove this kind of constellation uh, of new communities. They were complementary to each other, but differentiated. Um, they then sort of maintained the existing farmland, kept landscape, and then saw those as potential places for amenity. It maintained the valleys and built on the side of the hill, so it's about keeping the trees. Um, and these became more extensive activity spaces. So it's really about setting it within the landscape. The quality was already there. You don't have to create the quality. Um, you're just building into something that's already a, a fundamental resource. And Yolanda was talking about 
attracting talent. You know, these, what are the kind of spaces? It's not just understand them. The work that we do in, in terms of knowledge cities is about the urbanization of innovation, the urbanization of, uh, of industry. But at the same time, it's about the quality of place. What are you offering? And I think, you know, Oslo has that. And so they're building their kind of settlements around existing elements within the landscape. And how that engages then with that landscape is fundamentally different. Um, and they look at different ways of, of how they may engage with that. And again, you know, what I, I mentioned briefly, you know, the charter town of, of Palo Alto here, you know, it's, it's a fantastic environment within the larger sort of metropolitan region of San Francisco. Um, and, you know, it's attractive in its own right. So in that sense, it's, it's already off to a head start. And when you look at places, oops, when you look at places such as uh, Santa Cruz, you know, you're building within riverine landscapes, you're building within forests, you're building within meadows. Um, and they, they, they naturally differentiate the environment where things such as housing, amenity, civic activity, etc., are established. Almeria is very interesting because, in a sense, it started out as a dormitory. It's 30 years next year since it was actually um, started. Uh, it's got 200,000 homes and it's got 16,500 businesses. But it started out as a connected uh, dormitory to Amsterdam with a, a well-established train network and tram network. But also it has an amazing environment of lakes and waterways. And there's a kind of, there's a more organic approach. So there are small developers, self-builds, <laughs> Um, you know, people getting together and building their own houses as a kind of corporate body, but our residents, um, which you see in Germany a lot as well. And these are the things. It didn't attract everybody, but it was about attracting the people that wanted to be in this type of place, because you couldn't get this in Amsterdam. So people are now, you know, and then it's the pioneers that actually start this kind of thing off. It's the things that you actually... You know, you might buy into a house design. You know, we've actually, before, we've actually designed houses for a website. People pick them up. They want one of those. And then you help them actually then deliver their house. At the same time, there might be a people that just build their own house, what they call Freikavel, which is where you buy your own land and then you build on it. And so, again, you know, this is where, and I've got friends who just, a bit of sand, build their house. You know, in five years' time, they might have a neighbor. And I think, you know, is this the way? We need to understand how we can differentiate the way in which we deliver, you know, housing and give parts of plans over to this type of development because these are the people who are going to be there probably first. We might not make their money in the first year. And I think it's interesting when you look at Hafen City um, and the way they developed that, you know, very early on they tried to create as much mix as possible um, as the extension of Hamburg on the waterfront. They were very clear, obviously it's a very strong city-state, but it was about establishing um, multiple stakeholders and developers that only got a little piece of the pie, deferred their profit to actually a 15-year plan over the course of the larger development, but tied them into it. So they weren't going to make their money this year, but they were going to make their money eventually. And they had more of them, and they tied them into certain agreements. And it created a lot of diversity, a lot of need and the resources and a lot of mix between businesses and residents and families, etc. And so what we have now is that in 19... When I moved to the Netherlands in 91, it looked like this. And when I left in 2008, it looked like that. And in a way, it was a dormitory town that became a city in its own right. And so it's, and now they're thinking of about 2030. So they've done 30 years, now they're thinking about the next 30 years. It's a 30 year plan. I must admit that when I used to get off the tram, uh, the station here and go down to see a client somewhere along this railway track, it did look like a one horse town. 
you know, there was two blocks back and you had a field. You got to the end of the, the main shopping street and there's another field. But there's a lake over there somewhere. But there's a lot of other residential communities around. And now they're building the heart back into it. And this is their plan for, for 2030. So again, they're thinking about the next 30 years. So, although dated, Howard's diagram seems to continue to aspire. But how can new towns attract innovators, families, and institutions? How can new towns respond to changing work patterns and establish networks of entrepreneurship? How can the landscape become part of an associative and civic environment, an extension of the home? And what are the growth stages of city building? Thank you. <laughs>